Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at the brand new Retroid Pocket 3. Now before we get started, I do want to mention that this is actually a pre-order that I put in the day they announced the pre-order. This is the 3 gigabyte model, but since then they have reached out and they're sending over a review unit. Now on paper it says that that one's going to be a 2 gigabyte unit. So we can definitely take a look at the quality of the review unit versus this one here, which was just a basic pre-order that I put in with my own money. So I've actually been really excited about the Pocket 3, and these are definitely marketed as retro gaming consoles, but one of the main things that I wanted to do on this was game streaming, be it Moonlight, Steam Link, xCloud, GeForce Now, and even PS5 streaming. And we've got a 4.7 inch 16x9 IPS display, which would be great for playing PC games on this. Before we go any further, I do want to address the elephant in the room. There's definitely been some controversy behind the Retroid Pocket 3. This handheld was actually supposed to be released in November 2021, but I do want to draw your attention to Taki Udon's video. Link for it will be in the description, but basically he's been testing the Retroid Pocket 3 since 2020. He's got a ton of hours into the handheld, he's given the company lots of feedback, but a couple weeks before this was supposed to launch in November 2021, he found an issue with the screen, so it came down to the LCD driver, where if you go to 30% brightness, the screen would flicker uncontrollably. Now if it was just on the prototype he was using, it'd be okay, they could go back and swap out that LCD driver chip, but here's the deal, they already did a mass production run using that driver chip, and they told him that they would go back and replace it, but there is a big chance that some people are going to receive some of these units with the older driver chip that gives you that issue. And really, when it comes down to it, they should have went through and replaced that driver chip in every single one of them, and we're not exactly sure if they did. He also voiced some concerns about software bugs that he found, and the company claimed that they're going to fix these in an OTA update. So I would highly recommend checking that video out. He spent more time with the Retroid Pocket 3 than anybody else has, and if you're interested in these handhelds, he's got a lot of great videos over there, so I'll leave a link to the channel and the video in the description. But for this video, we're going to be taking a look at the Retroid Pocket 3, just like it is, right out of the box. This is a pre-order that I put in the day the pre-order was announced, and I've had a few days to spend with this unit, and so far I'm actually really enjoying it. Now, I will admit that most of the stuff that I've been using on this is game streaming, so playing PC games from my main PC or my PS5, GeForce Now, or or xCloud on this unit, but we will be taking a look at some native Android gaming and emulation because after all this is touted as a Retroid emulation handheld. When I put my pre-order in, there wasn't much information about the CPU they're using here or if they were using conductive pads or dome style behind the D-pad and the buttons, but it looks like this is actually using the same exact CPU as the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus. So we've got the Unisoc Tiger T310 quad-core CPU, and out of the box it is using the dome style buttons and D-pad just like you'd find in the PS Vita, but they also include the conductive pads and the PCBs so you can swap over if you want to. It would have been nice to have this out of the box, but to tell you the truth, I don't mind these dome styles on a handheld like this. It's not a deal breaker to me. But just keep in mind, if you want the conductive pads, you'll have to do it yourself at least at launch. I'm not sure if they're going to change this down the road. So when it comes to the specs of the Pocket 3 for that CPU, we've got the Unisoc Tiger T310. This is a quad-core ARM CPU. We've got one A75 core at 2 GHz and three A55 cores at 1.8. The GPU is the PowerVR GE8300 at 800 MHz. You can pick this up with either 2 or 3 GB of RAM. Both of them are going to have 32 GB of internal storage plus micro SD card support. We've got a 4.7 inch IPS display with a resolution of 750 by 1334. It is a 60Hz display with a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. It's got a 4000 milliamp hour battery running Android 11 and when it comes to pricing, 119 for the 2 gigabyte model and 129 for the 3. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the 3 gigabyte model because that's the one I pre-ordered. I wanted a little extra RAM for Android. So straight off the bat, first thing I noticed when I booted this thing up was the screen. I really like the way this thing looks. It's not a super high-end display, it is IPS, and we've got some really good viewing angles. And it being a 16 by 9 aspect ratio isn't great for retro gaming because we'll have those black borders on the sides. Or you could always go through and use bezels, but for native Android gaming and game streaming, this is the perfect aspect ratio. As soon as you start the unit up, it's going to give you a nice little walkthrough. It'll ask you if you want to install some apps and Google Play services, so we can get Google Play. Obviously, I did it here. And the way it looks right now, we've basically got the AOSP Android launcher, but they do have the Retroid Pocket launcher built in for retro games. And this is pretty cool. It allows you to configure many different emulators. 
We can head over here to a section that I've already got set up. Let's do uh, GBA. And as you can see, I've already got some games installed. I just placed them in the correct location, scanned for the games, and it automatically downloaded box art for me. Some of this stuff isn't finished downloading, but it will do it on the fly. So I'm just using the default location, and I set it up for a micro SD card. I've just placed a 400 gigabyte card in here. And if we head over to my Dreamcast section, I haven't set this one up yet. All I need to do is select ROMs, choose Add a Directory. We're going to go with the default location that's on my micro SD card. It's going to scan that directory, download metadata and box art for me. And with all of these games, we can set it up with a different emulator. If you want to use RetroArch, that's totally fine, or you could use a standalone emulator. But uh, the way I've got it set up right now for my low-end stuff, I'm running RetroArch for the high-end stuff using standalone, like PPSSPP for PSP. I'm even using a standalone N64 emulator known as Moopin64 Plus, and N64 does run really well on this device. And one thing you really got to keep in mind is this does have a lower end CPU. It's not a top of the line SOC in this unit. If you're looking for raw performance, I would go with the Odin Pro or even the Odin Lite. Both of those will outperform the CPU and GPU we have in the Retroid Pocket 3. And as you can see on screen now, we do have some proprietary settings built into Android specifically designed for this device. We can change the button layout. I've got mine set up like an Xbox or you could go retro with it. It's up to you. Now we've got a touch screen built in on the Retroid Pocket 3 here, but they've still added the mouse function, which might come in handy for some people. Actually really easy to set up. We need to set up a hotkey, so we're going to press two buttons at the same time and hold them down for about three seconds. This is just going to set our hotkey to turn that mouse function on and off, and with it on, we can actually navigate the full operating system from the analog stick, and we've got a mouse cursor on screen. It can be disabled or enabled at any time. So yeah, they've definitely added some really handy software here, and uh, there is a little more to it when we get into gaming. I'll show you that in a second. But let's go ahead and take a look at the I.O. and the buttons on the unit itself. So down here at the bottom, we've got our speakers. We've got a micro SD card slot, our USB Type-C for charging and syncing the unit up, and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. Really nice to have that on an Android device in 2022. Over here on the right hand side, we've got a physical Android home button. Over on the left hand side, we've got our volume rocker. And one thing I had to get used to was the start and select button being up top here. It's a little out of place, but I mean, you can definitely get used to it. It would have been nice to see them on the front of the unit itself, but it does keep it nice and clean. We've also got our power button and micro HDMI up here. And moving around back, got a nice clean look. I really think they did a great job with the design. I love the way this thing looks. Jumping right into some initial retro gaming, first up we've got GBA, and with this CPU we've got more than enough power for the low end stuff. NES, SNES, PC Engine, you want to do some Neo Geo, CPS 1, 2, 3, obviously we've got some GBA working really well here. Using the Drastic Emulator, NDS also runs really well. And uh, I've had really good luck with Dreamcast using ReDream. Now you could always go with Flycast if you want to, but I've been using ReDream and it seems to perform pretty decently on this with no upscale. Now with Flycast, there's a chance we could upscale some fighting games, but with this one here, even using Marvel vs. Capcom 2, I'm just at the native resolution. And with this one, I always like to test out the D-pad. Now remember, I've still got the domes here. I haven't swapped out to the conductive pads, and that might feel a lot better to some people. The D-pad does move a little more than I'm used to with these domes, so maybe later on down the road, I will swap it out. But for now, it does work. Another system that runs really well on this handheld is N64. So I'm using the standalone version of Moopin 64 Plus FZ. You can get it from Google Play, or you could always use RetroArch if you want to. But I've had a pretty good experience with N64 using this emulator on the device. Even something like 007 Goldeneye is playable. And I do want to mention that with everything that I've tested so far, I haven't had to map any of the controls. Redream, RetroArch, and Moopin64 Plus FZ just automatically had it set up for me, but with the higher end stuff like Dolphin and Ether SX2 for PS2, you will have to go in and map the controls or do automatic mapping with Ether SX2. I also wanted to show off a little bit of PSP emulation, and this was the first system I started noticing some issues with when I move over to higher end games. I'm using the standalone version of PPSSPP. Vulcan Backend, 1x Resolution, Tekken 6, which I consider a mid-range game to emulate. 
it does run really well. But moving over to the harder to emulate stuff like the God of War series, Killzone, and even Midnight Club, I did have to turn frame skip on. And this is where it comes back again that we have a lower end CPU. Remember, we've got four cores and only one of them is running at two gigahertz. Now it's great for the low end stuff and even a lot of PSP games at 1x, but with the harder to emulate stuff, you may have to turn frame skip on. I'm personally not a huge fan of it, but it does work out if you have to play that game. And the final emulator I wanted to show off, at least for this video, was Ether SX2 for PS2 emulation. This is Crash Bandicoot, The Wrath of Cortex. It's actually an easier game to emulate on ARM. Right now, from the preset, we're at fast or unsafe mode with Ether SX2, and I've got the resolution set to 0.5. So we're at half native resolution, and unfortunately, we're just not getting great performance out of this one. Lots of frame skip or cycle skips going on because I'm in unsafe mode, and another one I tested was Gran Turismo 4. Now don't get me wrong, there will be some RPGs and 2D games that'll probably run at full speed with the PS2 emulator on this device, but I wouldn't run out and buy one of these specifically for PS2, 3DS, GameCube, or Wii. And again, I will admit, I'm sure there's some games that will run with each of those emulators given your settings and tweaks you do, but it's just not got the power to go out and buy it specifically for those systems. Now it's time to move over to some native Android gaming, but before we jump into it, I did want to show you a couple more features they have built in here. Once you launch a game, you can swipe over from the right hand side, and from here we've got a few different things that we can do. For games that don't natively support controllers, we've got a built in on-screen mapper. We can set these anywhere we want, and in turn, we can map it to a physical button. We've also got an on-screen FPS counter, floating window here, we can move it anywhere we want. We can also set up uh, to show the network, and we've got a RAM cleaner, which does come in handy because after all, we've only got 3 gigs of RAM and 2 if you opt for the 2 gigabyte model. With other apps running in the background, it will definitely help out by killing some processes. And since I was already messing around with Dead Cells, I figured I'd go ahead and show it off running. Unfortunately, it won't hit 60 FPS. I don't have high resolution on or anything like that. And from the settings, we can lock this at 30, but I wanted to see how high we could get it. I'd say we get an average of around 35 out of this game. Next up, we've got Minecraft. Obviously, this has been on mobile for a while now, and it's very well optimized. I'm at six chunks, I do have fancy graphics off, and it's running pretty decently. We can't quite lock it right at 60, but it's still an enjoyable experience playing Minecraft on this device. Like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, one thing I was most excited for on this unit was cloud gaming or even streaming from my own PC. It's got 5 GHz Wi-Fi built in, and in the future, hopefully we get something in this form factor with Wi-Fi 6. It would definitely make streaming a little better. But where I am right now, I've got a pretty decent internet connection, and when it comes to cloud gaming, I haven't run into many issues. I've tested GeForce Now, Stadia, and Game Pass. We're going to go with MK11 real quick. And I'm not a huge fan of playing fighting games on the cloud, but when I'm facing off against the CPU, I'm not really worried about it. If I was playing in a tournament or something like that, I'd never go cloud gaming. It's still usable like this. I wanted to test one more here, one of my favorite racing games, Forza Horizon 5, streaming from the cloud using the Game Pass app here. Not bad, and like I mentioned, I do have a pretty decent internet connection. And that definitely helps out with cloud gaming, but one thing I've been doing with this handheld quite a bit is using Steam Link on it. You could also go with Moonlight, but I've personally had much better luck with Steam Link. I've got my main gaming PC set up in the house, it's ready to go. And that PC is actually connected to Ethernet, so we've only got one device on Wi-Fi. Same goes for when I use this with uh, PS5 streaming, been doing that a lot with it. But yeah, this has actually been working out really well, and this is a bit different from cloud gaming because I'm on the same network that the PC's on, so obviously latency will be lower. You're still going to have a little bit of it because we're not wired to that PC right here. But it's much better than cloud gaming, and uh, I've been able to play my favorite PC games on this device in the house with no issues at all. 
So far, I've been having a really great time with the Retroid Pocket 3, and I haven't swapped over to the conductive pads yet. I don't mind these dome-style buttons and D-pad. It actually feels pretty decent to me. Used to playing the Vita like that. And I personally haven't run into the screen flickering issue. I've tried all brightnesses, but you never know. I mean, quality control can be an issue when it comes to handhelds like this. So you really gotta weigh your options before you put the money down. At $120 to $130, it's not cheap. And you know, if those issues aren't there, then I could highly recommend something like this if you know what you're getting into. It's not a super powerful handheld, but there's still a lot of stuff that can get done with this. But that's going to wrap it up for my first look at the Retroid Pocket 3. I will have at least one more video coming up in the next few days. I want to spend some more time with this. I'll definitely be testing out some more high-end emulation. And if there's anything else you want to see running on the Pocket 3, just let me know in the comments below. But like always, thanks for watching.